Chachma raises a very, very fascinating question. In Parshas Truma, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives Moshe a very detailed list of instructions regarding how the Mishkan is to be constructed. And that continues into Parshas Tetzaveh, which is the big day kahuna, the garments of the Kohen. And even the beginning of Kisisa, this is all before the golden calf, there's some concluding instructions about incense and the oil of anointing, the Shemen HaMishcha. And then at the very end, the last thing Moshe hears before he goes down and sees the golden calf is he is given the reiteration of the mitzvah of keeping Shabbos. And this is the famous passage, for Shamru Bnei Yisrael es Shabbos, the Jewish people should observe the Shabbos, Lasos es Shabbos l'dor Sam brit olam, to keep the Shabbos as an eternal covenant. Rashi explains that why is Shabbos put here? What is the point? God is giving Moshe commandments about the Mishkan. Why is there a reference to Shabbos here? So Rashi explains that Hashem is telling Moshe that even though I commanded you, to build a Mishkan, and that's a great mitzvah. Nonetheless, when it comes to Shabbos, the building of the Mishkan is suspended. And indeed, as uh, you know, the whole definition of what is a prohibited malacha on Shabbos is based on the 39 activities that were uh, involved in the construction of the Mishkan. So according to Rashi, the reference to Shabbos at the end of the Mishkan is designed to put a limitation on Mishkan, meaning there's a mitzvah to build a Mishkan, don't do it on Shabbos. Now, then of course, a lot of things happen. Moshe comes down, there's the golden calf. Moshe goes up and down praying for forgiveness. The final time he goes up on Rosh Chodesh Elul, he comes down 40 days later on Yom Kippur with the second tablets. And the day after Yom Kippur is this parsha where he gathers the Jewish people and he commands them about the Mishkan. But he prefaces his commandment about the Mishkan with the mitzvah to keep Shabbos. So the Meshach Chachma asks, the, now Rashi again says the same comment that Moshe is saying that Shabbos is more important than Mishkan and therefore even though there's a mitzvah of Mishkan, Shabbos takes precedence. But the question that Rashi does not address is why is there a change of sequencing? When Hashem is speaking to Moshe, he first gives them the details of the Mishkan, and then he mentions Shabbos. The Shamru B'nai Yisrael, Esa Shabbos. When Moshe is speaking to B'nai Yisrael, he first mentions Shabbos and then mentions Mishkan. Now, if you look in Rashi, Rashi says the juxtaposition, or the meaning of the juxtaposition, is identical in both cases, that Shabbos overrides Mishkan. So if that's the case, why is there a difference in sequence? This is the question of the, of the Meshech Chachma. He asks two more questions. Uh, in Kisisa, when Hashem gives Moshe the commandment of Shabbos after the details of Mishkan, it begins with the statement, Ach es Shabsosai tishmoru. Ach, only be careful to keep my Shabbos. So Rashi points out, uh, based on rabbinic uh, interpretation, the word ach is always a limiter. It always limits the scope of a law, and therefore it limits Mishkan that you don't build Mishkan on Shabbos. The question is very obvious. If it would have said, ach es mishkani tivnu, then I could say Mishkan is being limited. But the word ach does not appear in the Pasuk about Mishkan. The word ach appears in the Pasuk about Shabbos. So if you're going with the theory that Ach is a limiting force, it would not be limiting Mishkan, it would be limiting Shabbos. The Ach is in the wrong uh, place to limit Mishkan. And a third question the Meshachach asks is the following. When it describes the violation for the desecration of Shabbos in Kisisa, it's, which is Hashem speaking to Moshe, it says, Mechalalaha mos yumas. Those who desecrate Shabbos, and again, we're not going over the laws of capital punishment, but you have to have two witnesses, and there has to be warning. It's very rare, but it says, those who desecrate the Shabbos, mos yumas, they shall surely be put to death. In Vayakel, when Moshe is communicating this message to B'nai Israel, he says, 
Kala Ose Bo Malacha, anyone who does Malacha on Shabbos, you must shall die. Now, granted, practically, there may not be much of a difference between you know, very certainly being killed and just being killed. But still, why does the Torah vary the language? Why does it say in Kisisa, when Hashem speaks to Moshe, Mos you must, and in Vayakel, it says you must. Right? Difficult. What, what it, and Bechlau, you'll notice in the Torah, when the Torah talks about capital punishment, sometimes it uses the double emphatic, Mos you must, and sometimes it uses the less emphatic, you must, shall be put to death. What exactly would be, would be the difference? So here, the Meshech Chachma introduces a very, very interesting aspect of biblical interpretation. And that is the notion, you know, there's a whole genre of literature, whether it's science fiction or political writing, which tries to deal with alternative history. There are also websites, alternative history. What would have happened, you know, had Kennedy not been assassinated? You know, what would have happened if, God forbid, Hitler would have, uh, would have uh, uh, conquered England? You know, how, would that, how that would have changed the war, right? Or Lindbergh would have been president. You know, whatever it is. People make, you can make scenarios and all sorts of things. So the Meshech Chachma, Lahavdil, applies the same idea to the Torah. The Torah itself could have taken different forms depending on the Chaito Ego and not the Chaito Ego. Meaning, this is an amazing thought, really, if you think about it, because you're going to blow your mind in the following way. On one hand, the Torah pre-existed the creation of the world. Right? The Torah was God's treasure many, many generations before there was a world. The famous statement of Chazal, Histakel Bioraisa, God looks into the Torah and God creates the world. The Torah is not a response to the world. The world is the response to Torah. Uh, the way, the way uh, many Meforshim like to describe it, it's not that because we have parents, Hashem said, honor your parents. It's the other way around. Since the Torah says you have to honor your parents, so there have to be parents that you honor, meaning the world is built around the framework of the Torah. And yet, and yet, this is the paradox. Although <coughs> the Torah predates the creation of man and the creation of the universe, the very content of the Torah is contingent on the decisions that human beings make for which they have free will. There's no question the Jewish people had free will to sin with the golden calf or not to sin, because God does not take away free will, except in very rare cases like Pyro. There's no question the Korach didn't have to sin. There's no question they didn't have these bites. So what form would the Torah have taken? Had, now, good. God knows the future. God knows the end of the story before it happens. So God could safely write the Torah based on what he knew we would decide. But at least in theory, there has to have been a plan B and a plan C and, and the like. And the Meshech Chachm is Mechadesh, that this is not only true in narration, meaning obviously if there wouldn't have been a Chedo Ego, there wouldn't have been a Chedo Ego in the Torah, but even in Halacha, Halacha itself would have assumed alternative configurations had there not been a sin of the golden calf. And then it assumes a certain iteration because of the sin of the golden calf. Because halacha itself, meaning the halachic structure of the Torah, may be subject to the contingencies of human choice. Based on this, let's consider the following. On one hand, we have a halacha that says, thou shalt not build a mishkan or a beis hamikdash on Shabbos. Right? That's very, very clear. We cannot build a beis hamikdash on Shabbos. We know that. On the other hand, there's another halacha, which is equally true, that the korbanos of the korban tamid, the daily offering, and the korban musaf, they are brought on Shabbos. If you would walk into the base of Mikdash, it's lucky we don't get these uh, demonstrators, Shabbos demonstrators, into the base of Mikdash. They have what do you mean? You're shechting animals in the base of Mikdash, right? I mean, you're shechting, and you're cooking, and you're burning, and you're doing all sorts of malachos. This is a well-known halacha. Now, it's true, you don't bring a private korban on Shabbos. If I have a sin offering or whatever it is, I do not bring it on Shabbos. I have to bring it during the week. But the korban sibor, the communal offerings, the korban tamid, the korban musaf, lighting the menorah, burning the katoras, 
This was done on Shabbos. This was done on Yom Kippur. If Erev Pesach falls out on Shabbos, then we shecht, you know, th hundreds of thousands of people would have their Korban Pesach shechted, and, and the, the, inner, the uh, inner parts of the Korbanos would be brought on the altar on Shabbos. So what's the chiluk? I can't build the Beis HaMikdash on Shabbos, but I can bring all of the Korbanos on Shabbos. So the Meshech Chachma says, the logic of the chiluk is the distinction, this is a halachic category, between what is called mitzvah and what is called hechsher mitzvah. Mitzvah is the actual act of serving God. Hechsher mitzvah is the necessary preliminary preparation for the act. Right? This is obvious. And many you, you have both. Sitting in a sukkah is the mitzvah. Building a sukkah is not a mitzvah. It's a hechsher mitzvah. Eating matzah is a mitzvah. Buying or baking matzah is a hechsher mitzvah. Right? Wearing tefillin is a mitzvah. Buying tefillin or even writing tefillin is a hechsher mitzvah. Right? There's this concept of mitzvah versus preparation for a mitzvah. Bris Mila is a very good example. Bris Mila, if a baby is born on Shabbat, so, uh, you know, a boy, and the, so therefore the eighth day of birth will be a Shabbat, so we do a bris milah on Shabbos, even though, obviously, bris milah itself is a desecration of Shabbos by causing bleeding and the like. And yet, even though a bris milah is docha Shabbat, you certainly cannot drive to a bris on Shabbos. I don't, mean, I don't just mean a guest. A guest obviously couldn't. But even the moel, who has no other way of getting there, or even the baby, if the baby needs to be transported, no, we're not talking about sakana, we're just for the bris. The halacha is certainly not. And the difference is, it is the mitzvah of Mila that overrides Shabbos, not what is called the hechsher mitzvah. Now, there is one opinion in the Gemara, which is not the halacha at all, the opinion of Rabbi Eliezer, who actually says, just like Mila is docha Shabbos, machshirim of Mila are also docha Shabbos. The Gemara even gives you a very crazy hypothetical to show you how far Rabbi Eliezer allows uh, any, any aspect of the Brit Mila to be Docha Shabbos. The Gemara says, according to Rabbi Eliezer, on Shabbos, you could cut down trees to make a fire to furnish a knife, to, uh, to make a knife which will be used in the Brit. Ad Kedei Kach, the Machshir of a Machshir of a Machshir of a Machshir is Docha Shabbos. But that's a Das Yochit. And it's absolutely clear, la halacha, no question about it, that only the mitzvah is docha Shabbos, not the machshirah. So now the Meshach Chachma says that same paradigm applies to the avoda in the Beis HaMikdash. The mitzvah of serving Hashem is through the korbanos that we bring. But we can't bring those korbanos unless we have a mishkan or a Beis HaMikdash. So the korbanos are docha Shabbos, just like a bris is docha Shabbos. But building the Beis HaMikdash is only a Hechsher mitzvah, to, or the Mishkan, same thing, Mishkan and Beis HaMikdash, later, is only a Hechsher mitzvah to be able to do the Korbanos and the Avoda, and therefore it's not Doch HaShabbos, right? That's the dichotomy of Avoda versus Hechsher. So says the Meshech Chachma, that is only true after the Cheda Egel. Had there not been a golden calf, had there not been a cheda egel, we could have built a mishkan even on Shabbos. Now, this is a total theoretical halacha because by the time the Jewish people found out about the mishkan, uh, there already was the cheda egel. But theoretically, and therefore the Meshe Chachma says not like Rashi. The reason why when Hashem speaks to Moshe the first 40 days on Har Sinai, he first mentions Mishkan, and Shabbos is secondary, is because under the original plan, Shabbos would have been subordinated to Mishkan, and Mishkan would have been Docha Shabbos. I'll explain why in a moment. It is only after the Chedo Egel that Shabbos has priority over Mishkan. Now, this is absolutely not like Rashi, but uh, according to this idea, the sequencing indicates the priority of the two commandments. And therefore, Mishkan before Shabbos indicates that Mishkan is Docha Shabbos. 
Shabbos before Mishkan indicates that Shabbos overrides Mishkan. And therefore, the nafkamina, the difference in the sequencing, is based on the status of the Jewish people pre-Ego uh, pre and post-Ego. Now, why would there have been, have been a difference? Because at Matan Torah, before the sin of the golden calf, we reached an extraordinary madrega of Kedusha. We reached a level of Adam Harishon before the chait of the Eitz Hadas, a very amazing thing. We actually achieved immortality. The Gemara says, had there not been a chait ego, we wouldn't have we wouldn't have died. In fact, the Gemara even quotes a hi, the Gemara even quotes a somewhat humorous statement of Reish Lakish that Reish Lakish says, we have to be grateful to our forefathers for sinning. Because if our forefathers didn't sin, we wouldn't have come into the world. They would have lived forever, and uh, we wouldn't have been born. There would be no need to replenish humanity. And therefore, because they sinned, uh, we have a chance to be born into the, into the world. So we reached a very extraordinary level. Based on the level that we reached, Hashem would be accessible to us in all places. We wouldn't be limited to a certain place to bring korbanas. We could bring korbanas everywhere. God's glory fills the whole earth. We could bring it in our backyard. As a result, why would Hashem then tell us to build a mishkan? So the Meshech Chachma says, it's not because the mishkan would be a condition for the bringing of korbanas. We could have brought korbanas anywhere. But the building of the Mishkan itself would be a korban. It's an act of homage, an act of glory, an act of serving God. Meaning, before the Chedo Egel, we wouldn't conceptualize the Mishkan as something that enables the bringing of korbanos, because we could bring korbanos everywhere. We would have conceptualized the Mishkan as a korban itself, albeit not an animal korban. If that's the case, the same way the korbanos are doche Shabbos, the building of the Mishkan would be doche Shabbos. And that is why in Kisisa, Mishkan precedes Shabbos. But once there's a chet ego, the chet ego introduces distancing. We're no longer with Hashem on the same level. It's true that HaKadosh Baruch Hu in his Rachamim, and because of our tshuva and Moshe Rabbeinu's prayer, Hashem forgave us. That is the great gift of Yom Kippur. Remember, Yom, Moshe Rabbeinu comes down with the second luchos on Yom Kippur. We sometimes forget, you know, we look at Yom Kippur as the Day of Atonement, but Yom Kippur is also the day of Matan Torah. In fact, it's almost a strange thing a little bit why we celebrate Shavuos as the day of Matan Torah since the luchos that came as a result of Shavuos were the luchos that were broken as opposed to Yom Kippur. But be it as it may, even though Hashem forgave us and even though Hashem renewed his covenant with us, we were no longer zocha to be able to bring korbanos anywhere we wanted. Hashem says, you can approach me, but only in a certain time, only in a certain place, and only in a certain way. At that point, the need for a Mishkan changed. It's not that the Mishkan was a korban, but the Mishkan was a condition to be able to bring a korban. Because you can only bring a korban in the Mishkan. As a result, it got demoted from being an actual avoda to Hashem to becoming a hechsher, a preliminary to the avoda of Hashem. And then you're back to the general principle. Only avoda is docha Shabbos. Machshire avoda are not docha Shabbos, just like machshire mila are not docha Shabbos. And therefore, the Meshachach says, the sequence, uh, I didn't yet say how he answers the other questions. I'll get to that in a moment. But the sequence is mamash, very, very brilliant. When Hashem is speaking to Moshe, it is before the sin of the golden calf, before the chet ego. That is why Mishkan is before Shabbos, because Mishkan is more important than Shabbos. Mishkan will override Shabbos. But when Moshe is speaking to Bnei Yisrael, 
this is already after the Chet Egel. This is the day after Yom Kippur. So Moshe understands the halacha now is Shabbos is more important than, than Mishkan. And therefore, the switching of sequence is a remez to the hypothetical alternative reality that the halachic structure of the Torah could have taken and would have taken had there not been a Chet Egel. And the Meshach HaKmash uses this approach in a few areas that he'll often posit that the wording of the psukim indicates that halacha itself would have taken a different direction, which is really, in, in some ways, a very remarkable insight because it, it kind of suggests, not suggests, but it highlights in a negative way human input into the content of the Torah. <laughs> that somehow our actions actually impacted on what the Torah says. Now, that's certainly true in narratives, obviously. If there wouldn't have been a golden calf, there wouldn't have been a mention of the Chedo Ego. But fascinatingly, it even impacts in the halachic structures in the way the mitzvahs would have, would have gone. Now, how does this answer the other questions? Now it's very beautiful. In Kisisa, it says, Ach es Shabsotai. Only keep Shabbos. Now, only, Chazal say, whenever it says only, that's always a limiting. So Rashi says, the limiter is you don't build a Mishkan on Shabbos. That's Rashi's, Rashi's picture. But the question is obvious. If ach is a limiting word, it would be limiting Shabbos, not limiting Mishkan. Says the Meshechachma, exactly. That Pasuk is before the Chedo Egel. Before the Chedo Egel, it's Shabbos that would be limited, not Mishkan, because the Mishkan would be built on Shabbos. Einachinami. Now again, this is not this is not explaining Rashi. This is cholik on Rashi, and in fact, I'll tell you exactly why Rashi could not possibly have even said this explanation. I'll, I'll tell you that in a minute. Now, what about the third question? Again, in Kisisa, it says anyone that desecrates the Shabbos, mos yumas, shall certainly die. In Vayakel, it just says yumas shall be put to death, shall die. So let's ask a general question. What exactly is the difference in, in biblical language between mos yumas and yumas? So the Mepharshim say, the Rishayim say, that mos yumas is the lashon that we use when the bastin is authorized to execute somebody. But when the bastin is not authorized to execute somebody, and uh, it's only death in the hands of God, we use the word yumas. So, mot yumas is misa bidei adam. Yumas is misa bidei shamayim. Now, the question you might ask is, why, why is that so? I mean, you would think that heavenly death is more certain. The answer is actually not. That the, the, a death sentence of a bastin is more certainly to be carried out than heavenly death. And the reason is, any gezeira from Hashem, that a person is going to die for his sin, in Hashem's rachamim, that gezeira can be annulled through the process of tshuva. Tshuva, if it's sincere, and of course Hashem knows it, whether it's sincere, tshuva can annul a heavenly death sentence. Tshuva cannot annul a human death sentence, meaning if a person is convicted by a basin that they have to die, even if their tshuva seems to be so sincere, we cannot cancel the sentence because of tshuva. And the reason, of course, is because as human beings, we, we can never gauge the depth of tshuva. So consequently, a basin sentence is a most humas, a certain death. A heavenly death sentence is humas. Now, but Shabbos is an earthly death sentence, so why would it say Yumas and Vayakel? So here the Meshach Chachma says a tremendous thing. There is a general rule that capital punishment in the Halacha can only be imposed, which you need is in Hedron 23, many, many rules, but one of the rules is you can only impose capital punishment when there is a Beis HaMikdash. When there's no Beis HaMikdash or Mishkan, you cannot impose capital punishment. Therefore, here is the cheshman. In Parshas Kisisa, when the Torah says, if you desecrate Shabbos, you're chay of Misa, it's not talking about, I desecrated Shabbos by building the Mishkan. 
Because at that point, I would be allowed to build a Mishkan on Shabbos. It's simply talking about desecrating Shabbos in the future. Well, once you have a Mishkan, if you desecrate Shabbos, you'll be high of Misa, just like the person who gathered wood. And that's why it says, most you must. But Parshas Vayakel, which is after the Chedo Egel, that is Mechadesh, a new halacha, that even the building of the Mishkan is forbidden on Shabbos. Now, if I violated that law and I built some of the Mishkan on Shabbos, I could not be executed by a Basin because I committed my act when there was no completed Mishkan yet. And therefore, the only sentence could be Misa bide Shemayim. It could not be Misa space. Right? So this is uh, a beautiful explanation of the, of the Meshech Chachma. Uh, but now I wanted to share with you a, a thought from the Nesiva Shalom. Many of you uh, maybe have learned the Sefer Nesiva Shalom. Nesiva Shalom is, uh, I don't want to say Hasidus for dummies. That's a, that, that, that wouldn't be the right way of saying it. But uh, it is Hasidus for non-Hasidim, meaning many, many people who want to have an opening in Sifrei Hasidus. So uh, one of the titles that is recommended is the Nesiva Shalom. And he says a very, very amazing thing. There's a medrash that tells us that the first Friday of creation, now that was a busy Friday. You know, we always talk about Erev Shabbos as being a busy day. This was quite a busy day. Adam and Chava are created. Adam and Chava are expelled from the Garden of Eden. Adam and Chava have two children, Kai and Veheva. The children are born on Friday, and they're grown up on Friday. And according to the chronology in Avos Rabbi Nassim, although you don't see this in the Chumash, Cain killed Hevel on that Friday. On that Friday. Quite an amazing thing. Adam, Chava, Cain, Hevel, all came into existence on Erev Shabbos. Cain kills Hevel on Erev Shabbos, all of it before Shabbos. There's a whole discussion. Uh, when were Cain the Hevel born? Were Cain the Hevel born before the expulsion from Gan Eden? Or were they born after the expulsion? That, that's a machlokis in Chazal, how to fit the chronology, although it's very clear Cain didn't kill Hevel till after the expulsion from Gan Eden. So on that Friday, Adam and Chava committed the tremendous sin that resulted in expulsion from Gan Eden. And Cain committed the tremendous sin of shvichas damin, of murder. So it mentions right before the setting of the sun, Adam bumps into Cain, his only son at this point, and says, so what's going on with you? And Cain says, ah, I did shuva on my sin. And the lushan of the Medrash is, v'nispasharti. And I made a deal with God. I made a compromise with God, like a plea bargain. And Adam Arishon then says, there's such a thing as tshuva? I didn't know there's such a thing as tshuva. And immediately, Adam Arishon began a song in honor of Shabbos, Mizmor Shir, Liyom Shabbos. And the first verse of that song says, Tov lahodos l'shem. Now, the Medrash is offering a little bit of a different translation. Uh, the standard translation is, it is good to give gratitude to Hashem. The Medrash interprets, it is good to confess your sins to Hashem, for he will forgive you. <clears throat> so the Medrash itself is teaching us a very remarkable thing. And you have to give credit where credit is due. As bad as Cain was, it is Cain that first brought the power of tshuva into the world. Cain was the first Baal tshuva. And according to the Medrash, it was Cain that, who taught tshuva to Adam Harishan. Right? That's what the Medrash says. In fact, if, if, if you look, I believe, in the slichas slich of some Gedalia, the, there's a slicha that is mentioned on the different personalities who did shuva. So Kayan is the first one that is, that is mentioned. But the question is, 
what, what is, this is the Medrash. The question is, what is Kayan's language? I did shuva venis pasharti, and I made a deal with God. He should have said, I did shuva and I was forgiven. Venimchalti, nislachti. What is nispasharti? And also, if Adam Arishan is so overjoyed about the power of shuva, why does he combine it with Mizmor Shir Lioma Shabbos? That's about Shabbos. What is the shaykhus of tshuva to Shabbos? Right, so th these are problems with the Medrash. So here's what the Nesiva Shalom says. The Nesiva Shalom says, we have to go back and analyze the existential internal anguish of Kayan as a result of his sin. When Hashem finally confronts him, Where's your brother? And of course, Hashem knows the answer to all these questions. But he says, where's your brother, Kayan? And Kayan answers with the very infamous words, Hashomer achi anochi. I'm supposed to watch my brother all the time. <coughs> and HaKadosh Baruch Hu then says, you know, I know what you did. And Kayan calls out to God and he says, Gadol avoni minaso. My sin is greater than I can bear. I will be a nav and nad ba'aretz. I will be a wanderer throughout the world. I will wander from place to place. And everybody that finds me will kill me. And the Pasuk says, Hashem gave Cain a sign, right? This is in English, the mark of Cain, so that nobody should kill him. Now, the simple meaning of the Pasuk is, the simple meaning, before we get to deeper interpretations, is that because Kayan is the first murderer, <laughs> Kayan now feels people are going to want to kill him. They'll be like, Goel Adam. And therefore, Kayan says, I live in terror. I live in fear. Although it's a self-imposed fear because he created it. He says, anyone that sees me is going to kill me. I need protection. I need secret service. So God says, I'll give you a mark that people know nobody can touch you. According to Rashi, by the way, the mark of Cain is actually a watchdog. He gave him a pit bull or whatever it is to kind of protect him from being, from being attacked. So dogs feature very early in the Chumash, right? Cain had the first guard dog to protect him. <clears throat> this is the simple shot, that when Cain says, nav and nod, and everyone I find will kill me, he is literally afraid of his, uh, of his uh, physical safety or concerned for his physical safety. The Nesiva Shalom puts a whole different spin on it. Kayan is not referring to physical endangerment. He is referring to the emptiness and <coughs> void of a person who is cut off from God because of his sin. Gadol avoni miniso. My sin is a greater weight than I can bear. It estranges me. It separates me. It's a crushing guilt that takes the life out of me. And I'm no longer connected to you, God, because of my sin. And I wander around looking to fill the emptiness in my life. When a person doesn't have Hashem, and there's a starvation in their soul, they look for all sorts of ways to fill that emptiness, whether it be drugs, alcohol, sex, workaholism, whatever it is. And Cain is saying to God, I'm going to go here and there and there and there and there looking for something that will fill me. But I know it's not going to be. And everything that I encounter, meaning every experience that I have, is just going to kill me more and more and more. That all I have in life is the countdown towards death, <clears throat> death, and oblivion. So this is a very powerful declaration. Kayan is not simply saying, oh, I'm worried people are going to hurt me. I need security. Kayan is saying, where is my life? What is my life? Who am I? And my life will just be an attempt to look for meaningful experiences in this and in that, which I know will never satisfy me. So now the Nesiva Shalom says, God responded by giving Kayan a sign. So this is his Chiddush. The word is os. 
Now, the word os is used in connection with Shabbos. Ki osi beini u So Hashem said to Kayan the following. It may very well be that most of your life will be empty and aimless and not connected to God. But I will give you the sign of Shabbos, which will enable even you to be connected. Now here, and that's what Kayan means, the Nesiva Shalom says, I made a peshara with God. What is peshara? Peshara is compromise. What is a compromise? You want something, and you get part of what you want. Kayan is saying, I want a life of connection. God is telling him, well, you're not going to get that 100% of the time, but you'll get it one-seventh of the time. So now, according to Nesiva Shalom, you see a very remarkable thing. Kayan gave us two gifts. Again, this fits to the Meshach Chachma, how human behavior actually changes the Torah. Kayan gave us the gift of tshuva, and Kayan gave us the gift of Shabbos. Shab now, again, what would that mean? I mean, Shabbos, after all, is the reality that God you know, created the world in six days and rested on Shabbos. But the Medrash is saying that it became a day of closeness to Hashem as a gift to Kayan for his tshuva. And therefore, that is the meaning. I did tshuva, and I got a compromise deal with the Almighty. And that's why other Marishon in the Song of Shabbos says, it is so beautiful to confess your sins to Hashem because he then gives you these gifts of spiritual, spiritual closeness. So again, it's a remarkable, remarkable, remarkable thing that sometimes through the sins and the tshuva that we do, there are gifts that are revealed in the world that otherwise would not exist. Now, this is a bit of a dangerous idea because this might suggest, you know, uh, if you remember Jacob Frank, right? Yeah, Yaakov Frank, Yimach Shmo. Uh, Shabzai Tzvi was the false Moshiach that attracted uh, thousands and thousands of Jews. Shabzai Tzvi actually was quite a brilliant person and Karim Tzvi was very, very proficient in Kabbalah, but he probably was seriously mentally ill in many, many ways. So, so Shabzai Tzvi is almost not responsible for what he did because he labored under, under severe mental illness and delusion. But one of the followers of Shabzai Tzvi, after a death with a fellow, Yaakov Frank, and he started a whole movement, an offshoot of Sabbatism that was called Frankism. And Frankism was a very, very, we really call it an evil movement because the Frankists were not only, you know, Shabbos desecrators and eating treif, which is bad enough, but, you know, they were involved in murder, rape, all of those things. And the theological postulate of Frankism was that since God loves the Baal Shuvah more than he loves the person who never sins, so we have to sin as much as we can so we can merit the light of repentance and become closer to God. Of course, they never got to that stage. They never, they never got to the Chuba stage. But there actually was such a theology, redemption through sin. So obviously that's perverse. Obviously that's corrupt. Uh, but it happens to have a kernel of truth in it. And the kernel of truth is, one is never allowed to deliberately sin. One is obligated, one is mechuyav, to exercise their free will, to be as righteous as we could possibly be. But it is the case that when we fail and we come back to Hashem, when we try to do the best that we could, Hashem will give us gifts that perhaps were not available prior to that sin. But that only works if you tried not to sin, meaning to say, uh, if you deliberately sin, you don't get those gifts, right? So redemption by sin is, by definition, never going to work. Because if you deliberately do it, you don't get any gifts as a result. But Kayin is an example. Right? Kayin is the example of the Koach of Tshuva giving us the gift of Shabbos uh, and, uh, and, and, and the like. You know, it's interesting that uh, some of you might be familiar. Uh, Hasidim, before Mincha of 
Erev Shabbos. It's still, it's still a weekday mincha. They say to heal him Kuf Zayin, to heal him 107. Now, what is to heal him 107? This is actually the source of when you bench Gomel. It talks about uh, the idea that Hodul Hashem Kitov, give thanks to Hashem because he is good, Kili Olam Chasto. And it talks about different people that Hashem takes out of their predicament. It talks about people that are lost at sea and they're in a perilous sea voyage and there's a storm and they think that they're going to die. When Hashem saves them, Yodu Lashem Chasto, that's the refrain. They give thanks to Hashem because of his chesed. And then it talks about people that are in prison, who are desperate. And again, Yodu Lashem Chasto. And then it talks about people who wander in the desert. Again, I'm not getting the order right. And then it talks about uh, sick, right? So the Emma says, the Gemara says, the four basic categories that have to give thanks to Hashem when he takes them out of their tzara are those that are enumerated in Tehillim Kuf Zayin. And since the refrain is, Yodu Lashem Chasto, they should give gratitude to Hashem for his loving kindness. That is the makor of Bir Chasagomel. So the four are those who wander the desert, the sick person who recovers, uh, the one that is imprisoned, and the sea voyage. Now, it's an interesting, interesting question, by the way. You just, you know, uh, the common mina ka'olam is that when we take uh, a flight to the United States or a flight over ocean, we actually recite gomel. Right? That's the common custom. If you think about it, it's not so obvious that that would be the case uh, because, because here is the thing. There is no unique, in other words, it is true in, in a literal sense. Well, I traveled on the ocean, so I got a bench gomel. But there's no unique risk of an airplane over the ocean, meaning you can say air flight is dangerous, although it's actually much safer than, than driving. Although I'm a nervous flyer, so I have to tell myself that. <laughs> uh, but if anything, a pilot will actually tell you that in some ways, if God forbid a plane has to land, it is actually easier to land on water than to make an emergency landing on land because you know it hits something hard. So in a sense, to say that the reason I benched Gomel on an airplane is because I went over water really makes no sense because there is no extra risk. Now, if you take the position that air flight is dangerous, then I should make it whether it's land or sea. And if you take the position air flight is not dangerous, then the fact that it's over water doesn't make it more dangerous. It makes it less dangerous. So there are postcoms that actually say, <coughs> well, they, well, they go in opposite directions. Either there is no reason to bench Gomel on an air flight at all, or if there is a reason, you bench even if it's over, over land. This chiluk that we make between ocean and that ocean is not, so, uh, is not so clear, but nevertheless, that happens to be the minag, because in the most literal sense, you've traveled over the ocean, therefore you make uh, the bracha of hagomel. Now, uh, the other benching of gomel, just you're in any other danger, that's already also a machlokas. I mean, obviously, we bench gomel for things like, God forbid, somebody was in a, it was in a terrorist attack and they were, they were safe. But I know that it's interesting that uh, maybe, obviously, Israelis are tougher than Americans. You know, I, American rabbis paskin benching gomel much more often than Israeli rabbis. I'll give you an, an actual example. Let's say you're sitting in a bus, and the seat in back of you is empty. And a big, big rock or projectile comes flying through the window, and it's two inches behind your head. So you ask an Israeli rabbi afterwards, you know, if that rock would have hit me, I would have died. Do I bench Gomel? So the rabbi will say, well, the rock went to the row in back of you, really. So, you know, you were not, you were not uh, endangered. You know, the fact that it was a different row. <laughs> now, uh, an American rabbi would always, oh, got to bench Gomel. Yeah, so it's interesting <laughs> that you get, you get used to certain things. So uh, what do you perceive as dangerous, what not? I mean, for an Israeli rabbi, like, you know, the rock has to, like, graze your forehead, and then maybe you'll bench Gomel. If it didn't gra graze your forehead, you know, it's not dangerous, not dangerous enough, but okay. Uh, 
in America, you know, if uh, the rock was thrown uh, three blocks behind you, or, you know, it, was, it was in a dangerous, a dangerous situation. But the question is this. This minug of reciting Tehillim 107 before Mincha, what exactly is the Shaykhus? It has nothing to do with Shabbos. It has nothing to do with Shabbos at all. And this is not uh, Nusach Svarah generally. This is actually, I, think, I believe it's, it's attributed to the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov said to recite this chapter of Tehillim before Mincha. And one of the explanations that's given, again, is a very beautiful explanation that these four people that are desperately seeking divine assistance are really metaphors for the spiritual brokenness that a human being can experience. So there are some human beings who are drowning in the ocean. Now, the ocean is often a symbol for hedonism and sensual pleasures in excess. They are slaves to the taivas of Olam Hazan, whether it's the rat race or whatever it would be. They are the Yordei Hayam, those who drown in the seas of secularism. Then there's another type of person who is imprisoned. That is the person who lost the capacity to feel emotion anymore. They're kind of dead inside. They're locked within themselves. Deep depression, but it, it doesn't even have to be clinical depression. A person might even you know, be functional. But inside, they've lost the capacity to feel deeply. That's the person in prison. The third category is the sick person. That's the person who is filled with rage. In other words, unlike the, in other words, the one in prison is the one who doesn't feel. The sick person is the person who feels plenty, but their feelings of rage, negativity, anger, resentment. And then finally, there is the one that's wandering the desert. Now, this is a positive statement, really. This is the person who's looking for water. He's looking for truth, but he hasn't found it. He's in a desert. He's looking, goes to Buddhism, whatever it is. He's looking to find something that will feed his soul. The insight of the Baal Shem Tov is that Shabbos is a hospital for the soul in which all of the different types of sicknesses, whether it's the hedonist materialist, whether it's the person who lost the capacity to feel, whether it's the person filled with rage and resentment, and whether it is the seeker after truth, will find a connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu on the day of Shabbos. And it was the Baal Shem Tov's Ruach HaKodesh that saw in these physical archetypes or these physical examples, archetypes of the various feelings and the various voids that we feel, which ca call us uh, to seek out Hashem on the day of Shabbos. And of course, when we say that Shabbos is neshama yaseira, an extra soul, so really the, the, the real translation of neshama yaseira is not so much extra soul. That would imply you have one soul and then you get another soul. But Neshama Yaseira means enhanced soul, enlarged soul, that on Shabbos Hashem gives us the capacity to connect to him in ways that we could not during the week. Now, when I say capacity, that doesn't mean it's a done deal. There's a well-known statement of Chazal. He who prepares on Erev Shabbos will eat on Shabbos. That doesn't only apply to Cholent and uh, chicken, although that's true also. Either, either prepare by making it or by getting a good invitation. That's also part of the preparation. But it also refers to the spiritual food of Shabbos. You want to get the soul food. I don't mean collard greens and, uh, and watermelon. But uh, you want to feed your neshama on Shabbos. You can't just walk into Shabbos and have it happen. There's the work and preparation that we do before Shabbos that, that, that allows you, your soul to take it in. So Hashem gives us wonderful, wonderful gifts, but the gifts require some preparation on our part to be able to receive those gifts. You know, the Rambam describes the ideal era of Shabbos, which I admit uh, that somehow I also am not, I'm not always able to do this, that uh, 
You're prepared for Shabbos like several hours before Shabbos. And you're sitting with eager anticipation as if you're expecting the queen or a king to be coming to your house. This is called Yoshev Umitzapeh. You're sitting and eagerly waiting. Some people have a minan that they actually set their Shabbos table, even if the house is not totally ready, they set their Shabbos table. Some do it Thursday night. Some do it Friday morning. And the whole day on Friday, therefore, they're looking at a table that has already been set in honor of Shabbos. And uh, those who do it actually say it gives them a different mental orientation. You know, Rav Yosef Dov Soloveitchik, the famous Rav Soloveitchik of YU, used to say that in Europe, he knew Yidin that were Shabbos Yidin, who kept Shabbos. And in America, he knows Yidin that were Shabbos Yidin. But the difference was, in Europe, he knew Yidin that were Erev Shabbos Yidin, that the aura of Shabbos was already an Erev Shabbos. In America, he didn't know any Erev Shabbos Yidin, because people work uh, to the last minute, and then like Clark Kent going into Superman, you know, change and shower, you know, two minutes before Shabbos. So Baruch Hashem, one of the things you see in Israel, in Eretz Israel, is that Erev Shabbos itself has a certain spiritual aura. There is, that, there, is, there is really a concept that Shabbos kind of begins Thursday night. That's one of the nice, one of the very nice things. Uh, for an Ole, that could be frustrating because you want to get some business done on Friday and you know, just isn't, isn't benimtza. But actually, it's, it's a very, very beautiful thing that the rhythms of Shabbos are already brought into the Friday. And we should try to do that in our personal life as well, because the more we can prepare for the Shabbat, the more our neshamot will be open to receive the, the gift of Shabbat. So Be'ez Hashem, we should all uh, take advantage of the bracha of Shabbat, which Chazal described as Hashem saying to us, Matana achat yeshli b'beis kenazai, I have a beautiful gift in my treasure house to give you, Shabbat Shema, and its name is Shabbos. May all of us be zocha to the haftacha of Chazal, that if the Jewish people keep two Shabbatot, miyad hein nigalin, they will be redeemed immediately. So have a good day.